if you're here to hear check about identity. Um, and it gets even less about identity towards the third part of the paper, which is actually about environment and ecology and specifically climate and climate change. So if I can put these things together in a way that makes sense to you uh, tonight, that'll be very comfortable to be happy with just that. So um, the first reference I want to make, and maybe you've uh, you know, you spent some time with this or have heard about it anyway, it is in reference to what I think is a sort of a new master document uh, for 21st century war strategy. Um, it's called the Counterinsurgency Field Manual. Maybe some of you have come across it if you're researching war, CFM 24. It's written uh, by or in the direction of General David Petraeus, uh, published on your University of Chicago Press. Um, I got mine in the cultural studies section my local Barnes and Nobles. It's a bestseller, one of the bestsellers the University of Chicago Press has produced lately. You know, it came out in 2007, and there's some pretty profound um, kinds of things I think happening in that document that I'm gonna, um, at least to begin with, take it more or less at face value. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what those are. Um, according to, to this version of COIN, counterinsurgency, um, that's spelled out in this document, um, we're entering another another epoch, another stage of war change in the way that war is practiced and also the, the, the reach uh, that war has. Um, and, and one of the things they talk about it, is that um, we're no longer, or not only, maybe not even primarily in a situation where war is occurring simply between coherent nation states. Why is a non-state actor? It's a very important thing. You read about that an awful lot lately in terms of what's going on in the street, in the streets, uh, in the Middle East and other places. Um, but also that um, we're entering a stage, uh, I think, uh, of war that's occurring in what I'm going to be calling an autogenically violent way. And, and let me tell you what I mean by this term autogenesis or autogenetic. You know, you can kind of break it down. It sort of means produced by or in reference to the very thing, rather targeted at the very thing that's doing the targeting. So we got this kind of weird loop to it where according to autogenesis or auto, autogenetic war, uh, the enemy is, is turned increasingly inward, or the distinction between friend and foe becomes a little bit um, less uh, visible and less clear as it may have under an earlier period where nation states fought against nation states across coherent uh, lines of battle. Um, and um, it, it, I think that, that there are interesting consequences and very problematic consequences to that kind of autogenetic auto slippage. It has to do with some pretty fundamental changes in the way civil society itself works uh, and certain civil society activities like cultural memory and media technology and the thing that, that I've written about, I suppose, most lately, uh, racial self-identification. These, these things are now you know, really officially and in a very concentrated way part of, a part of national security. Uh, and part of part of the very practice of war. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a section. In a second, the science of counterinsurgency is a new thing. Exactly. I mean, the the highlights from in the new coin manual are from Napoleonic Spain, French Algiers, British Malaysia, um, and lots of other examples of, of empires' eventual uh, failure. Um, but this, yeah, in, and this new counterinsurgency document um, is, I think. Um, uh, uh, an innovative kind of tactical uh, handbook uh, against urban insurgency um, and a sustained effort in global anthropology and anthropological kinds of practices as a way of, of, of conducting war uh, by other means. Um, Coin, especially, is fond of this term culture. You know, we do cultural studies some of us these days, and this word term culture has become a really important keyword. Uh, lately, uh, not just in terms of military culture, but in the way that culture itself becomes militarized in practice and on the ground, given various kinds of uh, campaign. <coughs> the culture is, uh, is, is now a, a, a pretty developed part, um, or a pretty developed, what they call, area of operation. You know, culture is, is sort of the area of operation, or AO as they, uh, as they describe it. It's operations, that is, uh, 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 Coins new operations are therefore paramilitary, political, economic, psychological, and civic actions. Those are all quotes from uh, from the coin, and and this identifies what the military strategists today, the folks I talk to and I'm reading, call a revolution in military affairs. What they refer to as just the RMA. Um, and the RMA, they say, construes warfare differently. I mentioned this before. This is just to repeat than an earlier enlightenment rendition where individual, civil society, state, and violence are all cordoned off one from the other. 
point here is that those distinctions are beginning to deliberately and sometimes by default break down, right? So the whole notion of citizenship uh, begins uh, to change. Um, here's a quote uh, from Defense Department uh, Secretary Robert Gates, who um, many of you know was a CIA director before Defense <coughs> Secretary, and as importantly, was a university president uh, for a number of years at, uh, at uh, Texas, what was it Texas A&M or Texas Tech? I can't remember which one. Um, the guy is, is also interested in scholarship and culture and, and some of the things that we do when we practice our work as scholars. His interest is wanting to use, quote, history, anthropology, sociology, and evolutionary psychology in, express, in mounting expressive civilian surges on behalf of military goals. So I'm not making a, a, a far-fetched and stretched theoretical association between culture that, 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 uh, and war. Um, suggesting that that work's already kind of been done, been done fairly transparently and fairly publicly uh, by the folks who are becoming weirdly, ironically, disturbingly, I'm not sure which, a lot more interested in culture um, than the folks who are usually involved in civil society matters, like politicians, <laughs> the public, the people who fund the university, the people who, who pay our salaries. I mean, while we're losing ground on health culture, uh, the U.S. Army and others seem very interested in, in gaining it. Um, you can play that out as you like. Um, the point I simply want to make about coin and the new coin practices is that war, uh, uh, questions of security and, and, and insurgency and counterinsurgency are, are starting to reach into and all the way down of uh, social relations. It's really becoming part of the of, the, of, 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 of what constitutes the associates itself rather than separated from it. Um, what's been called since, I don't know if you know, Toffler's famous work on net centrism, when they talk about relationality, not as mere opposition, but as a network of various nodes that are not necessarily determined by one point on the network more than the other. This is a kind of computer model of thinking about relationships. Um, this is something that's also been um, very much picked up by some of the new war doctrine. But net centric ways of identifying. And maybe you could see where this is going um, uh, as far as the race question. But um, for now, I just want to make the point that things like human rights, and here's a series of other quotes um, disease, poverty, climate change, failed states, ethnic strife, demography are all now being uh, dubbed legitimately as what's called force multipliers. That is, these are now variables that are going to be deliberately entered into the scene. Uh, of war. So I think this is a, a really vast, um, maybe we should even say uh, a total grid or a totalizing grid of militarized global concern that involves biology and economy, atmosphere and public sphere, without any one dimension being dominant over the other uh, during what is a period of apparently indefinite, possibly in, uh, uh, infinite war. I got a hand up over here, Dusan. Should I address it or should I continue? Well, I just want to know if you could repeat something. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, you listed rights and disease. You were listing the force multipliers. Yeah. Could you just list a couple? Sure. Uh, disease, poverty, climate change, failed states is the quote that I have from the speech by Robert Gates. Uh, <coughs> the climate change thing is going to come in at the end. Um, you know, the, the, it's so that, you know these things are now kind of being. They're not anomalies to the war problem. <laughs> These things become occasions through which we can advance explicitly military objectives. That's a hard thing to do. And I think it's a thing that's, that's unique and interesting to the current moment. Um, so the US national security strategy, what I'm going to refer to as the NSS. And by the way, if anybody else wants me to slow down and repeat, please you know, go ahead and raise your hand. But anyway, uh, this document came out right after uh, the World Trade Centers came down in 2001. And then there was a revision of it in 2006. So you've got a Bush uh, uh, Cheney version and an Obama Clinton uh, version uh, of this document. And again, it's very easy to find. Um, uh, common to both those documents, though, is this the language of a change in era, so a revolution of military affairs, the RMA. And that now war is going to run the gamut from partisan politics uh, the, uh, uh, to Facebook insurrection, to the civil war, to ways in which people self-identify uh, racially uh, and ethnically. Um, so again, here's another figure, whether you read him or not, I don't know, Jürgen Habermas, pretty famous guy for having theorized uh, <coughs> the distinction between state, civil society, and the violence being somehow out there. The state monopolizes violence. It gets to use either for 
or against citizens, although on behalf of citizens usually, but more importantly, its job is to keep violence someplace else on the other side of the state versus the state line. Okay? This is how Ramos's template, he talks about this as an enlightenment ideal of having a, a peaceable domain of civil society where people can communicate reasonably with one another and have to worry about the things that we increasingly worry about that have to do with violence and security and war getting into that bubble which may not have never really existed, uh, called civil society itself. Um, so Habermas has this notion not only of, the civil, of civilization, but of what you could call civilianization. The idea that the citizen is always also a civilian. And so that the, 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 the change that might be worth thinking about here in, in like keeping that language is not only the, the change in what it means to have a civil society or, a, or civilization, but civilization, a de-civilianization of civil society. Something that, that a guy named Paul Murillo talks about, he's an Italian uh, theorist of war. Uh, the point is this, that the privilege to imagine uh, that our, our patterns of consumption uh, or human relationships or uh, relative well-being exist outside a reality a global reality of violence upon which those activities actually depend is no longer something that the security strategy takes for granted. The idea is that the bubble is more or less hot. Uh, so contemporary warfare cuts across the traditional lines that separate force from culture. Here's a few more quotes from the NSS that all innocents are vulnerable, right? and that the global war on terror signals a moment in history where the enemy is not a single political regime or person or religion or ideology. So that leaves, that leaves both very little, but just about everything for, for war to enter into. What is war? War is a set of relations. War is a relationality. War is a way of existing. Now. War rather is not going to be a person from a certain nation or a person who's got a uniform on, Right, or, or, or a person who has some particular kind of religious uh, uh, affiliation. Um, it's everywhere and nowhere, as you could say, uh, all at once. So um, in advancing this doctrine, uh, this is the RMA, the Revolution of Military Affairs, Gates identifies the mode of war, and here's where we start to get into the race question, uh, that is not only diverse in its doctrinal origins, but he states that this new mode of war uh, requires diverse points of view of the countries we are dealing with in order to effectively fight them. So I want to try to push that a little bit and, and, and make an initial kind of general point, which is that um, this is a mode of war um, that um, proceeds, I guess you could say, against certain modes of diversity. But unlike this earlier civil rights moment that, that I was admiring with your silk screen murals as I was sitting in the audience a minute ago, it also works through diversity, right? through the manipulation of identity and through working certain kinds of claims and differences and shifts in, in identity over, over certain periods of time. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a second. But I wanted to mention the book After Whiteness again, and, and, and only because there is a, a, a hook in that book that I think will make things some, a little bit easier. Uh, to, to advance some additional claims here, uh, less about the U.S. in particular, because that's what After Whiteness was about. The subtitle of the book was uh, was the coming U.S. white minority, or was it unmaking a U.S. majority? No, it was After Whiteness, unmaking an American majority. So it really was about quote unquote America or the U.S. Um, this project is, is a little bit more, is more global in scope, but there was a chapter in, in the After Whiteness book that I, I think is legitimate to refer to here. It's the chapter that, that was on the U.S. Census 2000. The history of the census is a fascinating uh, thing to think about. Um, demography is very much politics in this country, and almost has been politics, very politically volatile, volatile kind of thing. Uh, it's part of the Constitution. First census took place in 1790, happens every 10 years. The way it happens, how it happens, who gets to do it, who gets to claim what identity, those things have never been the same from census to census, usually. Um, and so they do change, and identity categories are always changing. They're totally in flux, which should say something about how identity works in the first place. But um, let me even make the point specifically about Census 2000, because something happened um, that I think might be developed along these same lines of autogenic warfare, that is, enemy turned inward, citizen as target, citizen also as soldier, citizen as suspect. I got my first frisk today. 
of coming out of LaGuardia and got to be held in a little uh, transparent sort of uh, aquarium-like tank while everybody else just kind of filed around me. And I was in a sort of, sort of weirdly public holding cell there for about 15 or 20 minutes. Clearly, um, we're all suspects. At the same time, we're all citizens. Uh, this is interesting to me. Um, uh, that's what I mean by allergenic war. And I think, like I said, this, app, this problem with uh, with uh, with, with uh, the U.S. since 2000, specifically around the multiracial debates, um, could, could tie into that. Remember, I was talking before about diversity as security. You know, the way in which racial difference is not something protected or something that the state allows to have rights to advance one particular group in relation to another, and, and justifiably so, but the ways in which identities can be claimed, unclaimed, unmade, repositioned, manipulated, coaxed over time to, to, to adhere and cohere in particular ways. The moorings have come and loose uh, around this question of whiteness, and especially white identity, which I don't think is any longer presumed by by a whole lot of people paying attention as the norm. And certainly we are entering, at least in an imaginary, but still, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, important, functional way uh, about this idea of coming life minority, a reality, certainly where I grew up in California, where I now live in New York City. Um, so anyway, this census, great quote from Giuliani right after 9-11, you do not have the right not to be identified. Identity can cut in all kinds of directions, right? It's something you claim. It's also by claiming it's something that you already adhere yourself to in relation to a state, a security apparatus, as a set of politics you may or may not know that you have by declaring that identity, by identifying. That's the enigma in a statement like that, um, which is a, a legal state. Uh, you do not have the right not to be identified. The state, the only thing that a census says is you can declare, you can pick a race. But you got to pick something. <laughs> yeah, I, tr I tried it one, one time when I went when I was enumerated because before the ninth, before the Civil Rights Act in the late 50s and into the 60s, enumeration was done by what Ishmael Reed calls eyeballing. You know, they sent somebody out. Aha, got you. You're this. Uh huh. Okay, got you over here. You're that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was done by a state paid enumerator. After the Civil Rights uh, Movement, people gained the uh, 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 right to self-identify. So the idea was that if I self-identify, I can now do some more accurately, plus I can start own, taking some ownership in terms of uh, uh, correct counties and things of that nature. Well, the, 19, the 2000 census took it one step further and said not only can you identify yourself, you can identify yourself in as many categories as you want. Right? So you basically have both kind of accelerated a certain accuracy and a certain attention and a certain sensitivity in the direction of identity as a right to choose who one is. But of course, how that plays out where the, the rubber of identity meets the road of politics is that it undoes all the previous civil rights based categories which do carefully distinguish between black, white, Hispanic, not white, uh, uh, or, or black, Hispanic, uh, uh, and the other official five categories, right? So part of the weird paradox that happens in Census 2000 is you have organizations like the NAACP say, hey, no, we want to make sure that people pay attention to the Jim Crow uh, law of one drop rule of hypo dissent. It says you've, you've got to choose this particular category, which was based, again, paradoxically and uncomfortably on a series of laws that have to go, like, go all the way back to, 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 to what it meant to, have, it meant to have whiteness in the first place. So the undoing of whiteness and the enhancement of different kinds of racial identities, according to Census 2000, um, uh, allowed different ethnographic options and racial options to emerge at the same time it undid the very uh, 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 responsibilities uh, or state interests to pay attention to those more discrete forms of the category. Now, this whole Census 2000 pick every race that can apply thing was, was heavily campaigned for and supported by the right wing of the U.S. Congress. The thing which Gingrich was one of the main guys that, uh, that, that helped establish it. Um, and you had a guy, no kidding, his name was Tom Sawyer, uh, from, <laughs> you can't make this up, from Ohio, stock Republican, said the same thing. You know, this is all about, and they used the language of Martin Luther King. We have a right to pick who we are, this kind of thing, knowing full well. By doing so, you would now have a demographic nightmare, or at least certain forms of complexities, very high levels of complexity, would have to go through all kinds of different mathematical shenanigans to be put into some kind of politically salient 
right, racial game board that could allow civil rights to function the way that they had before. They're, they're interested sort in of having civil rights not function the way they had before, but their interest was in claiming civil rights and in so doing, evacuating their responsibility of liberal states. That's what I mean by this paradox, right? Um, you, so you read the, the multiracial debates and they want to get rid of the dichotomization of black and white, Eurocentric thinking, uh, so on and so forth. All things which one could sign on to, I would imagine, in, in, a, in a fairly progressive, at least theoretically progressive way. But once again, I think that um, the self-identification problem uh, within permeable race and ethnic categories, the state now legally mandates, releases liberal government from whatever previous civil rights obligations that the state may once have had. You get more civil rights, at least in terms of choosing, but fewer ways to enforce the kinds of racial policies that came by. So you get, the, you get the shell game going on here, right, in terms of the way this thing is being played out. So this paradox that I'm trying to describe to you is, I think, totally opposite to a new technique of governing. And this new technique of government is based on the disintegration of civil society in the name of its security and in the name of its preservation. This is part of this idea of autogenic warfare. You know that bumper sticker? Freedom isn't free. So the more free we feel, the more rights we give up and vice versa. It's, you know, again, that weird security feedback loop. It starts to kind of sort of, uh, you know, fold in on itself after a while. Um, now, you know, this idea, right, of, of civil rights and in civil society in the name of the, of the uh, abandonment of civil rights, um, you know, it does correspond with a new kind of war, which is not just a war against the state's political others, since the otherness problem now is everywhere, right? Everybody's one quarter something. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, one of the things you learn about is real fast is that people didn't say, people did say, they started this, they said, I'm Irish, I'm Irish. Polish, on this, on Italian, on that. Suddenly, whiteness coheres in the late 1860s around a set of interests that have to do with not having to go fight, to, to go join the North and fight the draft. So they say, I'm not Irish, I'm white. Right? And then we have this white black dichotomy that then has its life after that. But it's a fairly recent history of this whole whiteness business. Uh, and it's one I think that's starting to come apart at the seams. Um, and um, so, so this whole question of otherness and the question of war, think of that in terms of opposition, right? Um, I think that the, this fantasy. Uh, that we're having, and that I, you know, partly I suppose tried to criticize, but maybe also helped promote, uh, of a kind of post-white U.S. national imaginary. Um, I was doing an interview with BBC the other day, and they were saying, "Hey, you know, uh, we just reached a point here in England where 12-year-old, the 12-year-old person now is going to grow up into a world that's going to have fewer white British citizens in it when they're an adult than there are now, and there's going to be a white minority country." So this, Hallucination, the majority, majority, and what that's going to look like. People are starting to process that, that now. And the whole margin center problem is becoming very complex. Not just complex because they're inverting, but they're becoming complex because that inversion between margin center has even got to another level of complexity where everything's multiple. And you've got this loosening of mooring in terms of what it means to have a collective identity in the first place. Is it racial? Is it historical? Is it convenience? Is it momentary? You know, do, do, do I do this when I'm hanging out at the bar with my friends? Do this when I'm doing this other thing? I mean, you know, identities can change all the time. But in terms of racial and ethnic identities, these are the kinds of changes are now being coaxed forward as a kind of deliberate governmental policy or strategy. This is the curious part of it. Um, and I think this is something that has to do, if you just do a little conceptual abstracting, with this idea of state violence turned against foes that are presumed to be kind of everywhere and nowhere simultaneously, everybody's a minority, everybody's a majority. I mean, everybody's a suspect, everybody's a subject. I mean, the, the, the positions, the usual positions that allow a more a different and perhaps at least superficially more simplified history of, of race and rights and resistance take place seems to have been, been mutated into something very different. <coughs> this is sort of part of what I'm trying to get after. Um, I got a section here on the differences between um, the Bush-Cheney doctrine and the Clinton-Obama doctrine that I think I'm going to skip in the interest of time because I digress. Um, so let me uh, uh, actually just jump to one case study uh, of this autogenic war, post-white 
post-racial sort of incipient national hallucination or whatever you want to describe it that you know isn't quite there but that we're acting as if it is and trying to learn we who we are governmental processes social agencies the military to function and to advance you know objectives within right and it's something called the human ter terrain systems and anybody ever read of it or heard about it hcs another acronym the human terrain system uh, it's a it's a case in point um and I'll get to put out another sort of conceptual phrase here of a kind of chimerical logic, you know, like the chimera, something that's sort of crucial in the fact that it's not there, you know? Um, uh, and I think that part of this idea of the liberal state or of a certain liberal discourse that says, you know, freedom isn't free, or the more we identify you, the better we disperse our, or the better we renege on our responsibilities to try to protect you, because we can also find you, we can also persecute, or we can also search you, we can also surveil you, or a number of other things. The chimerical logic of a certain liberal notion of protection that's also one of persecution by default, or at least soft forms of coercion and surveillance and control. You know, control and inner freedom, I mean, that kind of, of, of chimerical logic of liberal democracy. Um, and, and I'm interested in this human terrain system uh, process as an example of that. And here's one for you. The Office for Operational Cultural Knowledge, that's not from uh, George Orwell. <laughs> that's, not, you know, that's, from, that's an actual existing uh, agency that if I didn't have tenure, I'd probably be looking into for, I mean, it is being aware the next generation of cultural PhDs may end up working, I don't know, but it is a, a state agency. Uh, and it has a very a fairly decent budget. It is an agency that also helps work with this human terrain system program. Um, and uh, I've got to get this line in there. You know, I teach at public state university. We've had 20 years of disinvestment where the state used to fund us uh, in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s. About 40 something percent of our budget was funded by the state. Now about 13% is. The state's getting out of the higher education business, period. So it's going to become some version of public, private, private, public. I'm not sure what. Nobody quite knows. But and lo and behold, um, this human terrain system program, and that is not meant to be snippy or facetious, it's a real thing. I mean, the jobs, you can read job descriptions that look a lot like what you might find in the Modern Language Association or the American Anthropological Association or any of the academic publications where you might find you know, sociological or cultural studies work. Um, they are, are, are poised and ready to, to, to um, I say here, to provide a fiendishly <coughs> generous rescue applied academic interest uh, through what they call the ascendance of cultural war. Um, you know, I mean, there's a famous saying, I think it was Trotsky maybe, but you know, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. You know, <laughs> that kind of thinking. I mean, the state may not be interested, or the people or some society may not be interested in culture, but the, but the army is. <laughs> you know, maybe in ways that, that, uh, that are, are fairly sophisticated and fairly profound. I talked about COIN, Counterinsurgency Doctrine, before, and how it, as a kind of general principle, takes identity and culture and specifically the historical narrative and demography um, as a new AO, area of occupation. Um, it, it was now not even be called, it's not even called a war against terrorism anymore. It's just, it's just, it's just kind of unironically, possibly depressingly, just called a long war. Yes, it has no beginning and it has no end. I mean, I, I've got a generation of students out there who have never not been in war, at least since they've been, you know, sort of conscious of it. And you know, they're 18 years old or going to 11th year, whatever it is now. And, and um, you know, we have we're, we're, growing, we're, we're producing generations for whom war is you know, pretty ordinary uh, and normal uh, and possibly even expected. Um, maybe on a good day, that's what it is. On a bad day, it's just something we ignore because it's so real and obvious. It's mundane. It's ordinary. Um, in any case, uh, these are uh, these are our, our, our interests. As I said before, uh, are finding their ways much more explicitly maybe than we know in terms of the war doctrine. So, here's what the HTS program is to reduce it down. It just it's a, it deploys teams of cultural workers, sociologists, anthropologists, academics, um, the demographers, linguists, people who study. Um, you know, social trends like I do, sort of float between disciplines and try to find friends wherever I can in this or that department. And look, kind of look at the whole enchilada, you know, society and culture and the, and the rest of it, and try to make some distinctions and try to say some things having to do with power 
and let people relate to one another and how politics work out. That's where a lot of this work is, is going. And um, they do cultural research with an emphasis specifically on ethnography. So i uh, circle back to this race uh, issue a little bit, right? Um, and they've got a term for it. It's called mosaic war. It's kind of like the Rubik's Cube version of it, right? So instead of cubes representing different colors, these might be tribal differences, or they might be particular ethnographic uh, differences. And the work of the human trained people are to go in and work that Rubik's Cube in such a way uh, so that size line up only momentarily, you know, for particular kinds of objectives, and then one moves on. So there's a kind of a, a deliberate capitalization on the race as social construction theory stuff that not 10 years ago was big academic news, you know, and that's sort of part of the official <laughs> US security policy. Uh, but, but never mind that. So, you know, we've got these teams in Iraq, we've got these teams in Afghanistan, uh, they involve very ex uh, experienced commandos and NGOs, you know, not, not, not governmental organizations and academics trained in cultural research and, as I said, uh, ethnography. Um, and uh, they, some of the literature, it's about bringing culture and community uh, in a really integrated way to an anthropological battle space. Um, and in this sense, um, humanity or the humanities and war kind of coming together is just another example of that you know, depletion of boundary between civil society, you know, the individual society, the state, and then what happens across the state border in terms of violence, right? Um, Hobbes is the perfect figure to go back and, and look at some of this stuff if you want to. Um, but the, thing I, the other thing I wanted to know, particularly, and this is a quote from the ATS program literature, is that they're focused on, they, they want to focus on what they say <coughs> identity, and they want to highlight what they call identity-focused insurgency. Right. It's, you know, this idea of identity politics that's sort of seen a little bit played out for a little while has come back and is really incredibly um, uh, uh, militant, you know, literally, uh, you know, so, sorts of ways. It's an identity of politics, you know, at the end of a barrel, or at least it's a soft version of military power. This is what the, the leather language they use as well, soft, soft power. Um, and I guess my linking point would be that this application of human terrain system stuff is sort of like a global census 2000 event. Um, you know, the working through of a notion of flexible identity, you know, choose, let us help you choose, let us work through Rubik's Cube magic towards some end, you know, of security. Um, and I think, again, the paradox is the same way, it's to win the peace through war, uh, and it's to turn, and I think it turns, um, you know, uh, 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 civil society uh, or whatever sort of residual calculus that the liberal state may want to hold on to directly against itself. I mean, this is the autogenic part of the crisis, this idea of implosion and the shimmer of being left, right? So, um, you know, here's some more material, if you like, from the HTS. Commanders are instructed to pursue a network strategic basis for whatever relations among groups. Uh, usually tribal eth group ethnicities may exist momentarily on the ground. Um, but see the cultural. Uh, oh, we should we should uh, uh, we should uh, see create divisions between movement leaders and the mass base. We can seek cleavages between groups, cross-cutting ties between them, and reinforcing the widening seams uh, between them. Uh, their term cultural analysis. Battlefield worker should quote generate, store, manipulate, and provide cultural data from hundreds of categories derived from U.S. academic sources. Uh, open, you know, the open, open source work that we're doing. War in this order is based on the manipulation and exploitation of diversity and diaspora. We talk a lot about global diaspora. How good this could be for recalculating the Rubik's cube of of identity and belonging. I mean, this is a very different thing than traditional forms of racial containment against which the whole uh, uh, rights-based notion of, uh, of uh, a liberal discourse, uh, you know, uh, uh, advanced, okay? So here, I think, maybe, is a globalized version of fine-tuned demographic, demographic struggle that surrenders rather than protects racial identity that reneges on white skin privilege rather than taking it at face value and proceeds from a position of intrastate violence. Intra meaning within, but also against. Intrastate violence, I-N-T-R-A, 
rather than national coherence or anything like a piece of the public sphere. Right? The military occupies the very zones of civil society in these scenarios. So I think um, to use a, a maybe, I don't know, dangerous term, a kind of race war of this order represents only part of today's array of new war tactics under what I called before the, sh the chimera, the chimerical neoliberal state. Um, I also would just put out the word chimera and by wanting to hold on to its Greek uh, and, and, uh, uh, connotations. Um, if you can think back about images you may have seen with some literature from antiquity, the chimera is not just an absence, it's an amalgamation. When it shows up, it's a, it's a woman with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. And so it, all, it presents a category problem. You know, what kind of agency is it? It is an agency that is absent, but it is also a form of agency that retains and holds on to an unthinkable set of combinations and identificatory allegiances, right? That can't even be predicted to take place ahead of time. This is another, this is the B side of the releasing race from its uh, traditional historical moorings that other assemblages may or may not become a problem. It also, the Shemra, uh, has this special resonance for me as a location of invisible violence which is really the, the, the capital of the, of the, of the neoliberal state. Um, so um, I also say here, just in closing on this, I'm going to talk about drones for a little bit, that the chimerical neoliberal state, um, I think of it almost like democracy itself, or certainly any notion of a post-white democracy, is something illusory, uh, but something that also has the potential combination of agency and affiliation that are very different from what we're used to seeing when we think about war, when we think about military. All right, so that's what I'm going to talk about. But that's stuff I want to talk about regarding race. Now, this is going to still be about civil society. It's going to be about violence. But it's all, we're going to shift now to some technology questions. And then I'm going to try to make some connections between them. This is a second part of the talk. Um, I'm just about a little over halfway through. So, uh, so bear with me here. I a little more time. Um, the, uh, you've probably read a lot about drone warfare, this, this new kind of embrace, really, a cross-border assassination. Uh, you can do that even with countries you're not necessarily at war with. Um, uh, these uh, these uh, 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 drones uh, are, uh, are, are all about what, what's being called an extraterritorial application to war. You know, um, the, uh, the drone technology right now has become extremely sophisticated. It's not only limited to visual, video, image-like representation, <coughs> being back in real time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, there are drones deployed over and above, not just battlefields, but <coughs> potential battlefields. A lot of cities, a lot of urban cities, a lot of cities in, in, in you know, at about 30,000 feet. Reading license plates numbers, watching people using various complicated forms of algorithm to see what social movement patterns uh, might exist on the ground. Um, this is the giveaway uh, for the other keyword in my title, the aerial empire. And there's something else happening with the empire here that I'm trying to complicate having to do with traditional racial distinctions. But I think also the fact that these technologies are happening the way that they are, that are allowing us to determine the enemy in ways that maybe even exceed the idea of the individual and the individual body, that war, war to be like always already going on and for the image to be captured and just already just about to be gone or just about to, to, be, to be removed. Um, there's, there's a real nefarious history, which I also won't go into, about UAVs. Probably no Nazi V1 and V2 rockets, right? That's where the technology originates from. It was exploited in 1959 by the Rockefeller family, uh, who were pursuing interests for Chase Manhattan and Standard Oil over Latin America. Um, you know, we could trace the interest in extra juridical violence very easily back to some of these Cold War applications. Um, uh, what I'm interested in, is more particularly, maybe more technically, than just that very interesting political history, is sort of what's happening with our experience of time and with the experience of time, let's go to the philosophical abstract with regard to drone warfare and the idea of real-time war and the idea of compressing the decision-making loop so that the time between literally it takes to see a target and the time it takes to strike that target is compressed. So that's kind of a small version of the idea of do we go to war, do we not go to war, when does the war end, when does it start? Well, there's no beginning, there's no end, and there's no in-between. This is the new temporal reality preemptive and permanent war 
right? It's oddly, it, it, it seems to me, in tune with some of the kind of technological possibilities that are happening around uh, the UAV, uh, what I call someplace the dronosphere, as opposed to the public sphere, right? Um, so you got pilots sitting in Las Vegas, appropriately, or just outside of Las Vegas, right? They come to work in the Kiss of Family Goodbye Club in the morning, they sit behind a computer, series of monitors all wrapped around, looks something like a militarized version of a trading desk on Wall Street, and uh, coffee and Sprite and whatever else you got, and you're, you're sort of working your magic and love working the keyboards, and mostly you're not actually doing the killing. The killing's being done by a machine, and the human is just kind of there as a more or less expendable, maybe at some point, cautionary buffer. Uh, to make sure, uh, you know, uh, until the technology gets right or right enough that, that the machines can't do the work on their own. And that's exactly, you know, where things are headed. The language they use is really chilling. Um, they talk about um, drone war as allowing you to compress the kill chain. And they call it first feed, first look, first kill operation. And here's, here's the, the, uh, the language from the Raytheon Corporation. Uh, before you can, before you can, uh, drop your weapon and run, you're probably already dead. Right? So this idea that you know, that, 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 that weaponized time itself and duration, you can get an edge, right? And this is not just with the individual person, this is about predicting certain kinds of uh, 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 insurgencies and things that are going on in, in cities all over the world where these little UAVs are hovering. Um, and you know, I don't go into technology, but it's not just about image, it's about carbon detection, it's about heat detection, it's going to be, soon become about molecular kinds of imaging. You know, something that looks, remember, remember the matrix where all the numbers are running down the screen, something like this. It's just a matter of focus and scale, you know, in terms of where you want the image or where you, or how you want the target to look. Yusuf and I were earlier talking about uh, drug warriors. And by the way, for the first time ever, the Air Force has graduated far more drone warriors than actual pilots. To, are getting disturbed by having to actually look at some of the, uh, the graphic you know, effects of, 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 of killing that go on from these heights. By the way, where you can't even see the, the drone. The drone is 30,000 feet above. The bomb comes from nowhere, so he's walking down the street, and that's it. Um, and so um, they're actually they develop the vacuum technology. And I'm not clear yet on whether or not it's to lessen the, the affective response to the act of killing, or it is to make the target appear more accurate. But you no longer need the human shape anymore. You know, you you, you you can just make you can just have triangles, you know, or you can just have dots. And you can you can do it in all sorts of ways that you know edge the human being out of the feedback loop. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, uh, problem, a disturbing one for me again because of this problem of time. There is no distinction or a decreased distinction between the time it takes to take a picture, to shoot something, and the time it takes to strike. Um, this is what I meant by the, the, the drone over here. It's a, it's a mediational shift, a shift in medium in culture, uh, such that war squeezes close the duration between violence and representation. Because, you know, it's, it's all more real war, but it's also all more virtual. You know, these are some of the kind of paradoxes that are going around um, uh, 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 this revolution of military affairs, specifically uh, with regard uh, to drones. Um, I want to say a couple more things on the drone thing, and I'll move on to the very last part, which is the shortest part of the paper. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I would say this. Um, we talk about HDS, HDS as a way to, um, as, a, as, as a way where identity-focused tactics are being highlighted. Uh, and uh, the problem of national territory when this is happening on the ground. Um, but there's more to the revolution of military affairs than just that. Since this happens, this revolution, in a way that you know works along this paradox, paradoxical shift in space and time. And it is, it may sound a little bit abstract, but just think about it. You know, war becomes more proximate, and then everybody's a citizen and a suspect. But it also becomes more distant, and that's being it's being it's being carried out. You know, some of the most lethal aspects of it from behind a desk chair in an air-conditioned office in the desert uh, that I was describing with the drone. <coughs> so you see this idea of proximity and distance, paradoxical shift there. It also happens really, really fast. You compress that kill chain, so you get rid of the decision-making possibility of it, but it's also latent. If these drones just hover, and they hover permanently, and they're always 100% all the time permanently deployed, it's not a place where war starts, war ends, 
two people come up, they meet, they shoot each other. I'm not trying to be oversimplifying here, but the technology has reached a point where wars can make them on permanently, indefinitely, and by any other name. You know, so they, they, they've now started, they're now litigation in Florida and Texas on whether or not chromes can be used uh, over cities uh, here in the United States, and I have a feeling that it won't, it won't be long. Um, so uh, the, the, here's some more sort of conceptual formulation, this so-called kill chain compression, Right, makes targeting an almost instantaneous act, but also means that war, in terms of beginnings and endings, is displaced by a time signature that stops in its track. And war is permanent. On the other hand, the dominant, what I guess I would call the eternal sortie, uh, makes war an up close and almost natural phenomena. And this recombination of a kind of time space interface removes the distinction between violence and ordinary life. However, each side may want to define the ordinary. When one walks in the streets, one never knows if one's also on the front line. So this is the point. One could even say that it reconfigures the notion of sides or crisscrosses them, given that the dimensions, including the internal dimensions in which the war machine has come to operate, the US war machine has come to operate both for and against itself, if this technology goes all the way through. Now, I want to. Um, pick up on something that I said when you asked me to repeat that list of things that people were interested in terms of the war question, and one of them was climate change. This is an interesting thing to me, and I, again, without, without being too clumsy about the transition, I think it does have to do with this pulling out an expansion, not just of war into a kind of atmospheric arsenal of satellites and <coughs> technologies and virtuality, all the more deadly and all the more real, so don't get me wrong for saying virtual, but also that's something that's happening not just geographically or spatially, but even geologically or chemically. Uh, the way in which the planet itself you know, has effectively been armed. You know, that's the way that the literature is reading it. It's been armed in a couple of ways. One way that it was armed was in Vietnam, and you, you may remember this. Well, everybody knows about Agent Orange. I think, I hope. I mean, there's still 300,000 infants in hospitals in, in Vietnam, one of the main hospitals that are still suffering from all kinds of deformities of cancer because of the ignores. That was one way in which the environment was called uh, to war. Um, the other way that, that the environment was ca called to war, what they call environment, environmental modification, or NMOD, uh, was, uh, was through something um, called uh, 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 Operation Popeye. And this was uh, a, a program uh, in in uh, in Vietnam, um, where uh, I'll read you some statistics here. Uh, between 67 and 1967 and 1972, um, there was an attempt to uh, seed the clouds with sodium sulfate. Tons and tons of sodium sulfate were seeded over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, or rather silt silver iodine. Sorry for C-130s and F-4 Phantoms in order to produce heavy rain uh, over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And these things were tried, were funded by General Electric. The research took place at SUNY Albany, where I teach. Um, it was all about environmental modification. We could own the weather, you know, and turn the natural processes and plant into a weapon. We could have environmental uh, uh, modification by design. I want to talk about something even more deadly, and that's environmental modification by default. Right? You don't need the you don't need the human agents anymore, or the F4, uh, or the C130 to disperse the solar iodine. We're doing a good enough job at that, and we you know, drive our SUVs and and, and, and uh, you know and, and, and barrier plastic. Um, uh, uh, anyway, there were the, the, the amount of, of work we're going to pop is astounding. I mean, you know, uh, thousands upon thousands of flights, tens, twenties of millions of dollars put into this. Um, 47,000 tons of cloud seeding material. Um, also, this was used against Cuba uh, in 69 and 70. People will know that you know, as part of the sort of uh, you know, uh, um, attempt to, uh, to, 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 to make changes there. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit now, is, uh, is from a guy in 1966, and this was the mentality that was going on during Operation Popeye. It's a quote here from a Navy researcher. We regard the weather as a weapon. Anything one can use to get his way is a weapon, and weather is <coughs> as good a one uh, as any. Now, after Operation Popeye, after Vietnam, uh, 
in, in, as the Cold War began to get, you know, get, get legs in earnest, mid-1970s, um, this uh, uh, cloud team was going on, by the way, over a country with whom we were not at war, can believe. Uh, you know, so we were, it wasn't as if we just started assassinating folks you know, in countries through playing warfare that we weren't at war with. This idea of cloud seizing was an atmospheric thing that knows no national boundaries, remember. Clouds don't stop. You know when they when they you know when 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 it starts drifting towards Thailand, you know I mean, this is the kind of bizarre you know kind of uh, contradictions in all of this. But it was actually the Soviet Union uh, in 1970 who brought this case uh, to the attention of the United Nations in 19 uh, late 1970s, and there was a, 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 a treaty called the Enmod Treaty, it's a UN treaty. I've got just a couple pages left, so bear with me, but it gets, it gets intense, uh, it, it seems to me, here with this treaty, because uh, it pulls some things together. Um, uh, and it was a, it was a viciously uh, 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 battle treaty, if you read the, the records of the debates, I mean, you've got some fascinating politics occurring there with Mexico, and particularly the, the two cold warriors uh, who were looking at the, the way to divide. The Russians were also very heavily invested in climate change uh, 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 technologies and, and being able to, to, put, to put that to use in war as well. Um, and, and here's what the treaty ended up saying. And if you listen, you'll, you'll see some caveats here in 1977, which opened up some interesting questions for 2011. Right? Here's the treaty. The treaty says, this is a quote from it, any technique <coughs> for changing through the deliberate manipulation of natural processes the dynamics, composition, or structure of the Earth, including the biota, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, or of outer space, so as to cause effects such as earthquakes and tsunamis, an upset in the ecological balance of a region, or changes in weather patterns, clouds, precipitation, cyclones of various types, and tornado storms in the state of the ozone or atmosphere, right along <coughs> contractual sentence, in climate patterns or in ocean currents. That's what was banned, right? But there was a really key modifier that the US insisted upon putting in to that and my treaty, right? One of the key conditions under which this treaty was ratified was this insistence that, quote, each state party to the convention undertakes not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques, and it was these next, this next sentence that caused the stir, have a widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects as a means of destruction, damage, or injury to another state party. Meaning, by implication, that if it could be localized, if it was short-lasting and not severe, then it was something that could be explored. Now, of course, depending upon where you are geopolitically, long-lasting, you know, if you've got brain storage, and enough foodstuff stored up for, for, for long periods of time, long-lasting is one thing. If you're living crop to crop, long-lasting is another. A whole temporal problem that I referred to with the compression of the kill chain. Well, the weaponization of time gets left wide open in that document, as does uh, this question uh, of, uh, of uh, of, of what constitutes severe. Um, so by attaching the definition of severe to these time-space caveats, like widespread and long-lasting, those are readily relational terms, the US delegate uh, to the UN uh, introduced a provision that would allow for a future deployment of ecological war. They managed to leave hanging the key provision that today allows for the sort of militarization of space and time that I've been trying to describe when I talk about historical narrative, identity, when I talk about compression of the kill chain, when I talk about drones. In a 1966 paper, this is the last couple paragraph, called Weather as a Force Multiplier, Owning the Weather in 2025, so we're on our way. The idea of, quote, full spectrum conflict presents weather manipulation as, an, as a more important weapon than the atomic bomb. Air Force 2025, that's the name of this uh, strategy paper, measures hurricane intensity in terms of bomb capacity, noting that a tropical storm is equal to 10,001 megaton, uh, megaton hydrogen bombs. The 45,000 lightning strikes that hit the planet daily are said to contain, quote, electro potential with offensive military benefit that might be induced by atmospherically buoyant microscopic computer, computer drones designed to see the sky with the chemistry necessary for aimed and timed lightning strikes. Now, you know, 
Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I'm going to make a point that's even beyond just the initial shock of, of such a document being written in a serious way. Uh, I said before that the war environment pairing, you know, is, is nothing new. Um, I mean, you can go back and look at Vietnam, go back further, you can go back to the to 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 to, to, to antiquity. Uh, when Roman soldiers salted the, the fields of, of, of Carthage to make people the first you know, echo nomads that we could probably have on record, or, or, or uh, the Spartans using the sun to blind their enemy off the shield, or, or Elizabeth winning a war against Spain because of a hurricane, or Napoleon getting hung up in, in Russia with uh, the winter and then deploying some of the first weather, weather people. The guy who, who discovered Neptune was Napoleon's uh, weather officer. Our modern weather bureau is, a, is, a, is an after effect of the Civil War, uh, where Lincoln actually strung up some of the first telegraphs to people to know where it was raining and where it wasn't. So it's a really fascinating history, tied with NOAA and the Weather Bureau, that's a totally 100% a military one. That's an interesting story, too. Um, but he, here's where it gets even kind of more interesting, but you know, certainly a little more complex, is that that's about the other doc, uh, 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 examples are about environmental modification by design. And it's something that you, know, you do on purpose. What's being talked about here is environmental modification by default, right? That, that is in some of these later documents, uh, what I'm going to just point out to you. That is, you can take advantage of the hurricane that you didn't see coming, or that we need to learn to be able to manipulate and develop strategies for redrawing geo. Uh, geopolitics at a global scale through the, the use of accidental, right, planetary forms of violence that are only accidental if you let yourself off the hook for having, you know, stuck so much carbon dioxide in the air to produce all these terms in the first place. The, pe the only people in the federal government not denying climate change are the people in the military. Not only are we having climate change, but it's a good thing too because here's how we're going to use it. We know that if this happens, we're raising water over here. We can uh, we can uh, you know, look for ways to address that kind of uh, refugee problem and to be able to mobilize that in this way or that way. This end mod by default is the thing that interests me and disturbs me in a in an enigmatic sort of kind of disturbance most because it's a further example of, of moving the human being out of the world. You know, just like the drone warfare is really human being out of Now, <coughs> planetary violence is kind of been set up, you know, or at least the, 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 at least certain kind of military strategists think that that course of planetary you know, volatility, resource wars, you know, that, that everybody's starting to talk about, or the continuance of hurricanes and the warming of the water and food scarcity and all the rest of it, um, are now part of a brand new branch of military science. Um, which, uh, which has climate change as an official part, a proactive part of military strategy. So I'm talking about atmospheric ways in which drone war is using you know, that kind of technology to, to do certain things. I'm also talking about war, you know, not just in identity and social fabrics and biology and people, we're talking about war saturating and <coughs> questions of planetary change in these massive historical scales. Um, that may, I hate to say it, end up um, exceeding beyond the, the shelf life of the human being per se. Um, so anyway, I, I'll close by saying this. Um, as I said before, the war environment carries on new, but the latest end mod removes the notion of deliberate, takes that out, and is dictated by conscious human action. Uh, at the same time, the end mod recognizes and embraces that the, that the state uh, can no longer be the guarantor of any peaceful social order. That's not what taking advantage of climate change is about. Insofar as Enma becomes a mode not just of waging, but also of modeling war, a new or at least, at least a newly conceivable ecology of war, stacks the odds against the long term survival of the human being per se. So, how the must thought the civil society was going to protect. So, the victory for this or that side of the global population is no longer a presumptive goal in the context of this aerial imperium. And in such a context, certain elements of the human population, as we're seeing, become disposable, uh, or more accurately, become living casualties in a conduct, uh, context of planetary violence that exceeds any of the old notions of political will. This is not a house we'd see in notion of planetary violence when you start talking about climate change as a force multiplier. Uh, there were 50 million, five zero million environmental refugees in 2010. And according to UN estimates, there's going to be uh, more than 200 million environmental refugees by 2050. 
in the ecological register that is coterminous with NMOD by default, that by design, by default, humanity itself becomes a side, a losing side, with a meshwork of transbiotic agency that wins by enveloping its human opposition. Uh, as early as 1925, with uh, the Geneva Protocols against uh, chemical warfare in mind, you might also want to know that because you know that chemical warfare comes out of, of fertilizer research. It's all about manipulations in the years, but never mind that. With chemical warfare in mind, the International Committee of the Red Cross, since 1925, uh, you know, implored the world to, quote, remember, they said, our common humanity. Um, within the Arab Empire, the memory of humanity uh, may be all that we're going to have left. Thanks. Mm. Have enough energy and time for questions. Yes, sure. I'm sorry, it was so still. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, information. Um, there's one question I would like to, you can able to facilitate uh, that you say the cultural war uh, is, is going to be continued. My question is, how long this going to be take place? As far as we're still a human being, mm -hmm. as you you know, about the world is going different place, and the technology become people sitting in one place and destroy the human mm -hmm. body somewhere. <coughs> how would be the prevent? How is it going to be uh, prevent to make the because the life is going to be destroyed? To my yeah. well, because no human being is going to be, uh, and all this problem is going to be third world country. Mm -hmm. You are not fighting with British. You are not fighting with. France, you are fighting in Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It's all. Because those people are um, going to be that uh, product. Mm -hmm. That something you do, you benefit from. How long do it? Well, I, I, uh, how long? Officially, forever. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying how long do I think that's a different question. Under what conditions might it change? Maybe would be a way of rephrasing it. Um, but I think that the planning that's taking place is for a duration of war that has no beginning and has no end. Um, but I also wonder a little bit about, if I understand the question correctly, the relationship between culture and war, you know, sort of, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding or misappropriating, as sort of two, um, you know, di as divisible, you know, sort of two separate things, you know, like the more culture, the less war, the more war, the less culture. And the more culture we are, the less from we are in violence, and so on and so forth. What I was trying to talk about was a, was a kind of a, a sort of um, not exactly instrumental use of culture on behalf of warfare, but a kind of warification of the whole concept of culture. Now, clearly, you know, there are winners and losers, and there are hierarchies, and there are, are still really nefarious forms of, of dominance and exploitation. Uh, that are going that occur under these conditions. You, you named uh, some of the countries uh, 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 and some of the resource questions that you know, we won't need to go over. The big, some of the big debates going on between the U.S. and China right now are about the oil reserves in Africa, and it's one of the things they're most interested in terms of these questions of culture. So it's not as if you know. Um, I want to suggest that you know the, that 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 the, that the payoff you know in this. In this um, this this new culture war combination, isn't very much in line with some pretty old forms of imperialism, and colonialism, and, and, and extortion or exploitation, you know, of, for, for, for the places or, or or of places that were formerly under the earliest version of empire. But what I am what I'm also saying is that um, the empire is also at risk. You know, the empire has placed itself at risk. In fact, the empire is imploding on, upon itself. In, 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 I would say, in, 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 in a never-ending, uh, uh, never-ending, um, you know, war that you know is taking place right here, right now. And I think the way it's taking place is already even. Doesn't mean when I say that everybody's vulnerable and at risk, or everybody's simultaneously on the front lines as much as they are just walking around the streets. That, that has different elements of risk, and it's a very uneven distribution of violence still, obviously, across the globe. But the question of whether or not that violence is 
finding its way home. You know, home as in the perpetuator of the violence, not being able to protect itself from the violence it thinks it's exporting or to import, you know, whatever it is it wants to import. I think that those channels are wide open. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think that I, I, I can tell you that the kind of research that's being done on urban warfare right now in cities in the global south or, or in, 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 you know, drone warfare hovering over the large cities in the Middle East um, are already being applied uh, to uh, uh, future prospects of insurrection and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I don't even know what civil disobedience exactly, but you know, certain forms of, of intrastate violence within, within the U.S., within North America. There are, there are, troops, uh, there are troops trained especially uh, for the eventuality of an internal collapse um, you know, within, the, within, within North America. So I mean, if I if I understand your point, your question correctly, on this last part, I'll say you can you can correct me. Um, I, I think that it is less an instrumentally guaranteed form of warfare where the U.S. is going to win, or where you know, and where the relations of domination and exploitation um, don't also have a tremendous, possibly a fatal quantity of risk for the person perpetuated the violence at the same time. It's an biotogenic war. I mean, the country, you know, the country itself, I think, is, has never been, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, can you think of a longer period of war? Can you think of a period with less economic security? Can you think of a period, you know, outside of the Depression where the, the divide between rich and poor has been more extreme? Um, I mean, this is not a, 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 a secure scenario right, from which to launch uh, far flung and, and, and long, long, long term, uh, 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 you know, ca kinds of military intervention um, that's designed to exploit natural resources in various countries and so on and so forth. I think that, I think it's you know it's it's an overreach. I think it cuts in both directions. The answer for next to your question is how long. <laughs> because why I'm asking about it when you say culture, yeah. culture is a, a type of the practice we need to be. Mm -hmm. Because without language, there's no culture. Yeah. Without language, there's no culture. That means it must be a practice is going. Mm -hmm. Because something in the world of practice is to be continuing. Mm -hmm. If you stop this type of practice, it will be we are the people that we stop. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. culture cannot be stopped except people are there inside the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I, that's I think I think that's that's one of the what's uh, ironically or paradoxically one of the ways in which culture has become significant again. I mean, I thought it was pretty much spent. You know, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of culture, culture studies people, and also a history of this, I'm a, a, a history or a student of the history of the word culture. It's not a, a, a very old word. It really comes onto the scene at a very particular place at a very particular time with a very particular kinds of story traditions. <laughs> Uh, just like the word society or individual or any of the other things that we could talk about. There are ways to historicize that and open that question up that are interesting. I thought culture, you know, was going to have, have had its moment, like like lots of other terms. And I, I'm not sure I want to take for granted that we know what we mean when we use the term culture. What I do want to say is that, that culture has become something that is being, you know, taken seriously, um, you know, by by the forces, you know, as a new kind of military strategy, and so for them it has a particular kind of logic that it may or may not, you know, uh, have uh, for us. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that we could that more culture equals less war. It seems like sort of, if anything, culture has gotten a weird kind of potency that could cut in a lot of different directions, including violent directions, um, for and against the people who are perpetuating these. These imperial desires. Yeah. I'm a little bit of a skeptic on the culture question. Question. Um, yeah. yeah. If I may just intervene here, the the, uh, the culture provides the um, system of stable relationship, tradition, mores, so on and so forth. Right. But at the same time, in the global community, it fragments uh, society. There's so many cultures. And there's so many particularities that actually becomes endangers coherency of society, which then leads to the conflict 
then, then we have to call military to actually provide security. And so because of that, it is that military becomes a culture. That is to say, that device that provides security and stability. And we see how militarization of the civil uh, life, I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you, you can see the, 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 the fashion, you can see the, the cars, I mean, the, the Humvees. I mean, it, it, there's a whole more and more uh, appropriation of military as a style of living, uh, which means that actually we are, but you know, we might be consciously against it, but there's a way in which we are, to osmosis, assimilating militarism and military way of life as, as this kind of uh, culture or system that provides what culture used to provide, some kind of stability. On the other hand, it's really not stable because it's also self-destructive, and I think that's, that's the rub in which um, you have endless war because you, you just can uh, uh, escape the uh, risk and danger, and at the same time you have to have something to control the risk and danger. <coughs> Say like how how do we escape this current scenario? Like <laughs> I feel like it's so yeah. sad and overwhelming that I feel like there should be. Is it just going to implode on itself? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I I, I mean, I thought about I thought about this question a little bit because I was I was looking at my papers and oh boy, you know. <laughs> yeah, but there is a there is a there is a flip side of the story, right? I mean, think about it. You just be, just because the liberal state. It, 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 for five percent of the global population, it consumes ninety-five percent of its wealth. No longer feels secure. Is that a bad thing? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't mean to be flip about it. Yeah. But for people like you and me who care, presumably, about the other ninety-five percent of the world, if the liberal state has given up its pretense, even not even a pretense, right, to quote unquote provide for the kinds of social services, protection from exploitation, egregious and, let's face it, criminal forms of wealth accumulation that occur in the financial markets. If that, and, 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 you know, I don't, nobody, I don't have to be the person who pulls the wool over it's yeah. living, living it. It's public knowledge. And we go on living our lives. Well, and you say, wait a minute, so what am I, what am I leading? Where are my allegiances? You know, I mean, it's almost like becoming an internationalist by default. You know, I mean, because you sort of say, well, you know, where are the struggles in the world? And now, and now, the culture question, I can't presume that, you know, as much as I love James Joyce, and I do as a literature professor, that if we read enough Joyce, the world's going to be a better place. I'd like to think that. Probably not. Maybe under certain circumstances with certain people, perhaps. But what's it done? It's forced a certain kind of complacency, a certain kind of cultural elitism that a tenured professor, professor, professor has, not for much longer, but at least for now. You know, to sort of be able to have and to house into a whole culture in some ivory tower fantasy. Um, that the ivory tower has become fractured, so we're not on our own terms. I, I, I don't like the fact that the state's getting out of the higher education business, but the state's getting out of every public interest business. The state's getting out of the business of the public. So then now what? Now what is that? Does that public mean now that it has some kind of allegiance that's set by default to a state that's going to make sure that there's a, 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 a reasonably equitable set of social relations within a civil society for the 5% of us that live in the bubble called the USA, right? So that we can pretend that all the other violence in the world that's going on doesn't affect us or more accurately isn't the very reason why we enjoy our 5% status in the world? You know. Um, I mean, those, those to me, I mean, I, I, I say this with such passion because I feel exactly the way you do sometimes. And I say, but yet there is, there, there have to be and there are openings here for other forms of allegiance. We're thinking about the kind of work that we do with knowledge, with representation, with technology, has somehow become relevant, material, political, through the back door. Maybe in terms we wouldn't have chosen. But nevertheless, I mean, you can't say the word culture anymore, um, really, I think. Or maybe you can, but I mean, you know, part of what happens when we evoke that term, it, you know, uh, is, it, 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 it is 
you know, is going to be the, uh, the what's that office of? The, the office for the operation of cultural knowledge or the human terrain system. You know, um, they, they, you know, they, they would rather we, 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 we enculturate, you know, our enemies, <laughs> you know, and, and or kill them, you know. Uh, but it's all part of what military work is being described as. I think that 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 makes it harder, but also more urgent. You know, to <coughs> find certain kinds of opposition. And, you know, go to the World Social Forum. You know, go. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of, of things I think that, that can happen. Um, writing books, probably not one of the more practical things that one could do at this particular moment. But um, there's all kinds of ways. Uh, any person can have to figure that out, I suppose, in their own way to, to affiliate, to make changes, or, or to, to struggle through whatever form of politics, whether it's one of despair, or one of hope, or one of chance, or one of risk, you know. Uh, but I think, I, think, I think I'm actually okay with the fact that um, it's harder to be comfortable in America, in the United States, uh, than it used to be. And when I say, you know, when I use the, that last term, I'll just say this last thing. When I say, you know, the memory of the human being as such, you know, maybe something we all have a thing we're at, what I'm interested in really is, the, is, a, is, a, is a history of contradiction around the idea of the human being as such. The human being as such gets its ceilings in the 18th century. This idea that aristocrats could no longer rule the roost, instead, allow the middle class, property owning, white male, bourgeois, and we're going to talk about human rights and property rights and that kind of way, not bloodlines and things like that. But the whole category of the human being was, you know, the history is kind of put, put to use by a handful of folks on a small island called you know, Great Britain, mostly, and some other enlightened philosophers, while the, the remainder of the world was not only um, either not part of the category of the human, or if to the extent that they were, they were also quite literally producing the capital to be able to afford that whole new uh, economic uh, uh, baggage that was necessary to say, I'm an individual. They were playing property or having a bank. That was all important from the sugar trade. You know, and, that, and, and the whole notion of enlightenment humanism has a really horrendous and contradictory history attached to it. I'm not much attached to the idea of human being. Or the individual. Right? Those, are, those are more obfuscating, <laughs> obfuscating uh, historically uh, than they are. I mean, I could be wrong with it. Probably some human rights people that, 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 would, that would really like to debate that. But a lot of the human rights NGO stuff that I see is totally folded in to a kind of set of contradictions that nobody seems to want to explore. Yeah? Just a few things. Um, <coughs> capitalism plays into this big, big uh, other side of that reason why or what does anyone have to gain by creating such a catastrophic environment. There's a lot of money can be made in exchanging uh, goods and services and places for people to be uh, picking up catastrophe and disaster after disaster. The other thing, what do you think of the harp? Yeah, I was, I was debating whether to bring that up. Oh, please, bring that up. Jesus, that's going to get me in trouble here. That's okay. We're here well, for you. <laughs> First of all, yeah, I mean, I think I think, as, I think there are not only, there's not only money to be made, there are grotesque, grotesque, un, 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 unfathomable stuff that would make, you know, Versailles look like, a, you know, a, Trump change, you know, in terms of the way that money is being redistributed, redistributed uh, in, in this day and age. Um, but the thing about it is that, you know, it, it, is, it has happened at such an advanced level in my argument that, 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 that you know, something's got to give, right? I mean, this is where the disposable population thing comes in, um, or even where the what does the state do? The state just make, make sure that big business doesn't fail. That's the job of the state. Is there any other job? No, I can't think of it. 
you know, um, whether it's corporate bailouts, whether it's you know SEC, whether it's Wall Street. So you know, part part of that logic, that autogenic logic, which says I'm going to protect by persecuting, I'm going to make money by destroying, make by destroying, produce profit by further exploiting, raise myself up while destroying everything else. Your part, the part, the, the the relationship between the everything else and the person doing the destroying have become ironically more proximate you know, through that very condition of such vast kinds of difference in concentration. Certainly this is true about military strength. I mean, you know, has there ever been a strong military? No. Has there ever been a more effective strategy against the military than the cell <coughs> and, a, and a roadside bomb, you know? Uh, or, or the terrain, the insurgency, the, the idea of insurgency. Well, I mean, this was a lesson in Vietnam. How could it possibly happen if we kill so many tens of McNamara, tens of thousands of X, Y, and we know that if that happens, we won't be able to win the battle. You know, this idea of conventional warfare, and I think even this idea of conventional capitalism has become a kind of, maybe becoming, you know, more transparently fraudulent, you know, in the eyes of the world, maybe. Um, than, 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 than it has been, or at least to the extent that, you know, um, the shenanigans we've been witnessing over the last five or six years, you know, the point in, in, into a direction. Well, it's not about free markets, <laughs> it's not about competition, working hard and getting ahead. It's about monopoly capitalism, it's about international banking, it's about oligarchy, it's about, it's about, it's about you know, trading in prisoner releases to get oil contracts. You know, I mean, these are the kinds of politics and machinations that, are, that we barely see the tip of the iceberg of. And if that's the case, then I think it's both liberating and, and utterly, you know, um, maybe just, just a bit of despair. But it also means that there are other couple ways possibly from the allegiance. Now, the harp thing. Maybe get, anybody knows the stuff about harp. You really? I'm surprised. I mean, yeah, it's the it's sort of well, you know, it's sort of array of antennas in Alaska. Um, the Air Force and GE and a bunch of others were put in there, and uh, it's an active uh, military um, tool, and it was designed originally to heat up the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a particular thing, you know, it's all sort of laid out, I don't think it's just, uh, you know, striations, because I don't remember them, but the idea is that if part of the ionosphere can be heated up, then it's supposed to be able to um, change the way radio communication works. That was the initial. It's a massive around 180 something antennas over a huge piece of acreage, and they're designed to heat up parts of the sky all over the world. Um, and the idea was that it, you know, like if you listen to the radio late at night, sometimes you get a really good reception, because the ionosphere actually changes depending on the temperature of the sky, and the waves will go through it differently so you can get perception or not. So it was a communication distortion device. And they started thinking, hmm, should I make it also do a bunch of experiments on weather modification? weather wars, and there's a ton of experiments that occurred through by cloud seeding. Um, there's a whole history that's been written. I'm sorry, it's interesting that you know. Well, we're not, we may be main, but we're not out of the loop. No, way. I mean, I haven't talked to anybody about this. I, I go to West Point talking to people about it. They don't even they're, they're, they're know We're smart. Me, but I've given lots of it. Because it's one of those things that people do, like you hear once in a while on a late night radio talk show. For somebody who is interested in, in sky technologies and astronomy and things like that, get into it. Because it's not this big, you know, like cloak of denial placed on it, right? Like, oh, it's that thing, people are making a big deal out of it. It's just conspiracy theory and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, YouTube actually, um, there are a couple that uh, in China yeah. uh, videoed this rainbow in, I forget the name of the town in China. At m about 20 minutes or so before there was this magnificent earthquake, uh -huh. and ever since I saw that, I've been keeping watch over clouds being seated and the uh, clouds and their strange formations. You know, like you can almost see the waves coming across the cloud formation because the clouds will splay out. Yeah, China's dumping a lot of money these days into cloud seeding. Um, because the, you know they're trying to feed 1.3 billion people um, at the same time that they're throwing them off their land, you know, to 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 to, you know, to build Coca-Cola plants and things. Um, but they've done, I know they're doing a ton of work right now, also in cloud seeding and weather weather modification technologies. Um, 
we've done enough, we've done enough, we've done enough, we've done a lot already, right? In terms of you know, the, you know, changing the way hurricanes work and warming in the atmosphere to, to simple acts of consumption. But you know, to, in order to understand that, we have to do something with the human agency question. You know, do we take responsibility for that? Do we not? Do we use it? Does it even matter? You know, and in fact, can can war work without human beings? Well, the tentative answer, at least as far as taking advantage of climate change, is yeah, it can work really, really well if we manage becomes more of a managerial kind of tactic than it is an operational one for the U.S. It's, like, it's the old price opportunity, you know, crisis and opportunity uh, that now gets put, back, put, put on to the, to, to the, the big strategio, the strategio game or whatever it is. And who should take responsibility for the casualties in this climatology warfare? Well, you know, I mean, the facts are pretty clear, right? That same 5% that uh, you know, consumes the majority of the, of the world's resources also pollute the majority of the world. Uh, you know, this idea of carbon tax, and you've seen what's happened with the Kyoto uh, uh, things. Uh, uh, you know, the U.S. and I think it was Australia, maybe, the only two countries that just more or less put a stop in the whole thing. And now the, the tactic is to... Um, is to is is to 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 uh, call the side the climate change debates <coughs> theoretical and up for debate or up for, for discussion and and uh, and uh, well uh, I, mean, I have, it's, it's, you can't find really a, a respectable scientist that doesn't believe that climate change in one way or another um, but uh, I think I think the official line is either it's not or it maybe is and the other. Uh, the long fish line is, yes, it is, and it can work in our favor. But I mean, that's the same logic, because I can keep, I can keep, I can keep uh, producing such vast disparities in the wealth, and, and nothing's going to happen. I mean, you know, I, I never think anybody's got nothing. There's nothing, nobody to be wealthy over anymore. You know, I mean, it's a, the system reaches a point of, of uh, you know, I'm just going to say uncharted territory, you know, in terms of a new kind of global elite. But the thing is, like, you know, if you do climate change really, really well, you get screwed too, <laughs> you know? That's the autogenic part of warfare. There's a kind of suicidal drift, you know, in some of this discourse. Um, and I think that raises the stakes, uh, you know? And, and um, I don't know, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I think that people who, you know, who, who, a lot of people who I've talked to who work in the military, um, you know, uh, uh, at least they're do that are on the ground or that are you know that are that are trained to be officers and so forth, you know. Um, believe in, in in the idea of the ideals, you know, that, that put them to war about um, sustaining Western culture or making democracy available to the world and so forth. Um, but they're also the same people who are really hostile towards the idea of drone warfare, for example. I talk to people at West Point, as you said, and they hate it because um, they say that this is consistent with autogenic warfare, right? It, 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 re it produces more enemies than it kills. Because for every person it takes out, you know, you're in a town walking around, you're home. You know, I mean, there's no, there's, it's not as if there's a front line and there's an enemy, you look at these things. They, they talk about it in terms of honor and those kinds of things. But what they say too is it does something um, to the battlefield that makes it harder for them to control the battle space um, themselves, right? Uh, because it is, it, you know, it's, it's death from the air. And again, 30,000 feet, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, <coughs> these, these, these vast arsenals aloft, um, you know, beating back all sorts of information and decisions being made, you know, either by computers through uh, algorithms or, or by people on the other end of the keyboard. Um, you know, that does something to the person perpetuating war that is as problematic, not as problematic, but that is problematic in, in, in a way that is consistent with the way that is problematic for the people on the other end of the stick. Um, you know, for example, all the forms of insurgency that to only kill two enemies or even ten more. And so you see all kinds of different divisions in the ranks on the use of this technology, too. Yeah. Yes. I'm pretty naive about uh, the drone warfare. Do you have any sort of numbers that can run down um, as to how many how many countries are involved in this? Or uh, I can tell you that I, 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 have, I have some whole set of footnotes here, which I which I won't read out loud to you now. But I'd like to give you references to you afterwards. 
I had mentioned before that as of, I think it was last year's graduating class, more drone pilots were graduating from the US Air Force Academy than were graduating to fly regular planes. Um, it started off under Bush with the numbers fairly small. And quickly, be, it, it doubled, tripled, quadrupled exponentially over time. So that now, as I said, there are any number of drones aloft everywhere or, or, or all the time, 24 hours being maxed up in real time. The countries that are using them right now, that I can just remember off the hand, US is big, Israel is big, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, China has some, uh, uh, Russia, uh, there are a couple of other countries. Oh, uh, Iraq, uh, or rather Iran, uh, has now got a, a drone a deployment system that, uh, that they're now trying to work strategies to, to counter, mostly using satellite technologies and stuff. Um, the, I didn't read that part of my paper, and maybe there were some members in there, but you know, part of the, the, the GPS uh, uh, stuff that, that <coughs> is so important for, for doing drone war came about by the first weather satellites um, that went up right around the, the, the late 60s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the drones were able to, were able to key off of the satellite technology there. Um, I, could, I could probably find somewhere, but it would take a little bit of time to get through. I skipped a whole bunch of the paper. But the numbers are pretty bad. Not, and not just that, the numbers of people killed I mean, are actually really profound. And it's actually 60% of the targets end up being civilians. And this is, this is pitched in a, in, a, in a way that's not supposed to be about a more humane way of going other human beings. <clears throat> it was more targeted and more precise. But there are lots of mistakes that get made. I mean, some of them you can find on YouTube. There's a section, I, mean, I hate to advertise it, but it is, it is eye-opening called Shock and Awe. Uh, and, you know, it's on the side of YouTube thing. It's a separate thing where a lot of these they're not drone pilots, guys in Apache helicopters and things, you know, or, or, or you're putting things on YouTube or through WikiLeaks and other things are ending up on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube. And, um, you know, you could hear them debating about whether or not it's a real target or whether it is, and then they just decide to pull the trigger or not. And, and again, you know, that this the weird thing is that there's, there's no actual presence, you know, the thing doing the killing, it's up here at 30,000 feet. But I, I read a statistic the other day where 60% of the targets have been civilian. Um, yeah, because, too, there are all kinds of calculations that go on. If there's a high target, there's a high value target in a house. Remember, the biggest thing about insurgent warfare is you can't tell a population from the actual you know, foe. So that you know, part of the challenge is to either decide which whether or not you're going to tolerate a certain amount of loss within population, because the population you know, war questions become all mixed up. Um, or, or you're going to, um, and then therefore you're going to allow for a certain number of, of, of civilian casualties to occur because um, you can't, you can't really tell the difference. Um, you know, or, or you're going to find more profound ways to, um, you know, to, to, to track them. Um, the maybe think of something that's kind of related. But I just read this. I haven't decided how to figure it in. But you know, one of the one of the things that happened during the Iraq War was that a bunch of U.S. copy machines, you know, copiers, Xerox machines, were sold to um, to uh, to Iraq you know, back when we were selling them. Those had other kinds of things, um, and that there were micro, there were GPS microchips in there, uh, and they were designed both to be able to read what was being copied and transmit it back without anybody knowing, but also to be able to allow for um, a drone uh, or, or some other, you know, far away, the, uh, there's a term for them, but they're high up planes so you can actually see the plane if you have to bomb those targets. So the copy machines were actually calling in airstrikes, and these things could be activated, you know, at a moment's notice. And there's a bunch of the whole sort of history that's emerging now. When the technology skip sales, everybody's afraid there are chips now. And it you know, the technology got so small, it doesn't take much to put a little tracking chip in there or put a kill switch in there where they can all go off at a certain moment. Some roguish person on an assembly line someplace has decided um, to engage in, you know, a media war. I mean, it is, these are media technologies. And, and, and you know, it's not as if we're going to go in there and take media about war. There's no more about. <laughs> There's no more reference to violence, or at least it's less accurate. To, to presume that from distance than it is to say that the act of knowing, the act of 
mediation or the involvement mediation in media culture is already utterly enmeshed, or I should say, in a system of relationships you know, that totally permeate that distinction between one piece or civil society and the front line. I mean, the copy machines. You, know, you can have to do all sorts of weird, interesting things with that whole notion. I mean, here they are reproducing their documents in the same time they're being transmitted. But now they're being transmitted, um, you know, they're already a target and you don't even know it. Um, you know, you're reproducing documents in more ways than you know. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a really weird logic to that. Um, in reference to the drones as well, I was wondering, is it true that they're more concentrated in urban areas, yeah. therefore encouraging the study of urban areas, kind of leaving behind the rural areas, which might be more of a problem as far as criminal activity and the real roots of the issues that you should be studying mm -hmm. and surveying? Yeah, you know, one of the first things I, I really read, read on drone warfare that really got me thinking um, was an essay, I think it was in Z Magazine, and um, it was about, um, uh, specifically about urban areas. And, you know, the technology, this was, this was several years ago, was such that um, they, they were about pattern recognition. And so it was about targeting movements less than people. Maybe this question of movements is also something you can think about in terms of the flip side to this question of individual you know, agency. But so they're, they're, they look at movement patterns, like in a big city, right? I mean, you, you think of these things as population forms, right? As, as sort of little atomist, atomistic units moving in kind of urban geographical spaces according to certain kinds of predictable factors. And those kind of predictable factors, whether they're traffic lights or whether they're hours of the day, you know, everybody's pretty, pretty regimented. I mean, that's part of what education does to you, right? You should go at a certain time, and then time, all the rest, and you kind of know where the flows are going to be. And so the earliest algorithms that they worked on were specifically about urban environments. And depending on the urban environment, not all the same, they created the algorithms that would be able to read time signatures. And they would be able to rather read uh, urban flows according to certain time signatures. And they're, they're, they're much more sophisticated now, but they could say, is there an anomaly here? And what is this crowd doing at the corner of X and Y at such and such time? And is that a camera or a gun? You know, I mean, and, and that, that, but that, that can happen automatically, right? You don't have to be sitting there watching all the time like the security guard. The computer, the technology itself, right, is being able to track and, and keep, um, Keep, keep account. And they keep learning, you know, according to what happens when these anomalies that show in the urban geographies are are, uh, are tracked. Um, you might be interested to know that um, our companies did most of the work for some of the heavy surveillance <coughs> technology used in China, for example, where all the streets are, are, are surveilled. And of course, the, 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 the rain firewall that we talk about that keeps certain kind of information from coming in and out of China. You know, I sat in China in a, in a cafe and entered in Tiananmen Square, and you know, what do you get? You get Tiananmen Square, and people hanging out, and waving, and having Starbucks, and you know, looking at Chairman Mao, and the rest of it. You know, you can jump on a plane and, and, and you know, go someplace else and put in China Square, you get something very different. Those technologies <coughs> for being able to look for keywords, right? Be able to block things according. That's not a human being going, I sensor, I sensor, I sensor, I sensor. That's a set of technologies working together to regulate certain kinds of flows of information. And the same technologies that are talking about are regulating certain flows of, of populations. The, the weird thing is that China has perfected that technology, re-imported it, and sold it to the US. So that now, for example, in New York, uh, there are, I don't know, there are 40,000 surveillance cameras right now south of 14th Street. And the latest things being tried out is the Chinese technology starting in the US with China got souped up to come back is sound recognition patterns. You know, like lingo on your cell phone, you know, dial, you know, so and so. Well, to be able to have these microphones on the streets that are super, super sensitive. And they're they're supposed to be able to be fine-tuned enough to be able to pick out anomalies in speech patterns or not or certain keywords, suspicious keywords, you know. Uh, it is just another tool that can be used. Um, out there. So the technology is sort of circling back and forth, not you know, where one state uses it against the other to get a leg up on some, 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 
you know, traditional state against state form of planetary dominance, right? These states, whether, whether what do you want to call China, like some kind of capitalist communist state, state capitalism, you know, kinds of ways to talk about it, um, and the so-called you know, free market or whatever you want to call our system, which is another version of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, something that we have, don't have a lot of time to talk about in terms of this international finance stuff. But anyway, those technologies are swapping back and forth, right? Not, not, not from one state is enemy against another state, but these states that are in collusion against who or what? Well, against these, uh, I would say, not exactly against, it's but necessarily infusing you know, population with powers of surveillance that, 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 you know, in some strange way, and maybe strangely guardedly optimistic way, um, give us something in common, you know, with people from really different places uh, in terms of the way that we're being hailed or interpolated with a security system it no longer says to you, you know, hey, you're a citizen. Yeah, I'm a citizen. And just like Hobbes said, okay, but my, my notion of equal distribution of wealth and become an individual if you protect my private property, we've got a more or less equitable system. Once you break that connection between systems, as we say, we'll say the subject where you mix those things up, then the subject has, or the citizen has the potential, anyway, or the opening to cross-affiliate in an intrastate, at an intrastate level. So that you know, there are ways of having things in common with, with, with uh, you know, with these other regimes that, that make them look a lot less like the enemy, you know, or the other. Who's the enemy? Who's not? At this point, those questions open up in these in these in careful ways. Um, yeah, I, I, do, I think I think that you're right. Those, as far as I know, the drug war first stuff is predominantly, you know, both in terms of historically and in terms of. Um, you know, the way it's been deployed now, an urban manifestation. And that's, the, the arguments about this in Florida and Texas um, are about, you know, pre-crime, you know. Remember that movie, Minority Report? It's one of my favorite movies. <clears throat> you know, and the, 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 where he gets, I believe, the Carvana crime before it actually happens. Well, that's what, that's the next step. That's what, that's what we're being worked, that's what's being worked on, because the information flows are so profound, and the technology for being able to deal with those becoming so precise that it does become possible to calculate with a reasonable amount of probability that something might happen. And that reasonable amount of probability may be enough. Remember that whole Bush doctrine thing is about preempting and permanent warfare. And not just warfare. Yeah. So this idea is if you know if the part of the security state or as part of this new surveillance technology is a kind of a you know a, a, a non-carbon based version of the precog a little bit little things that sat there and put the same thing and, and thought through the, some kind of weird neural network that could see crime before it actually happened. Um, and you know, this is not science fiction. I mean, it, it, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that you could get on this that has to do with that temporality issue. It's getting control of time and making it a security problem. You know, so the time, it the time it takes to raise a gun, the time it takes to strike, you already get. You know, that's the way uh, pitch. That's that's and that's it's true. But that, that's where they're talking about these drones and Texas support is is preventative. So it's a selective thing. Can I just interject in that movie if you've ever seen the the director's cut? No, I haven't. Uh, Steven Spielberg speaks eloquently on the danger <coughs> of using that kind of system. And he even goes beyond George Orwell uh, with this. The director's on cut. That, on that, on that um, if you get the DVD that has the director's cut on it. I'll check it out. Yes. I look at some films to show my class next semester and teaching this war stuff for the first time to an undergraduate class. And I'm really interested in it because, I mean, this is a generation of people for whom war has been a part of their adult life forever, for as long as they're adults. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, um, I've gone way past that. Yeah. But I, I did have a comment, and with all due respect, I fought in Vietnam. Okay? And I don't see anything happening now that just isn't the natural genesis of the technology we employed against 
the Vietnamese yeah. and the North Vietnamese and Cambodia and Laos and, and everywhere else we were that we were not supposed to be. Yeah. It just seems like the, you know, um, the next step. It, the, yes, an extension yeah. Yeah. of what we were already doing. And I, I guess it's just back in yeah. Afghanistan. Totally fair point. Totally fair point. In fact, wasn't it the, um, what's it called? Was it Operation Phoenix? Is that what it was called? Yeah. Operation well, Phoenix, right? Everybody? Yeah, but what we started out, yes, we started out trying to do was there were cultural attaches. Yeah. And then it was about building cultural diplomatic relationships, and at the same time, every single one of those people was assassinated. <laughs> and then we realized later on that what opened up there was a, not just a hang, hang, hang rate turning into a handshake, but a hang rate turning into a handshake turning into a sniper bullet. Uh, I think that's a totally, a totally uh, fair point. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about your experiences. Uh, I'm always interested in talking to veterans and as many people as I can who've gone through. Uh, so we, we did a cultural thing as well. Yes. I mean, we sent yeah. teams in from Montagnards yeah. and the mouth of the Neos yeah. and Hmong and yeah. everybody else right. and riled them up. Yeah. I mean, so we had the Hmong going out with crossbows shooting the North Vietnamese army. And talk about, you know, capitalizing an ethnic strife and widening cleavages and trying that. Yeah. I think I, here's what I, what I wonder about, you know, is whether or not given where the, where the United States was at the time, you know, um, you know, here was clearly a war, um, a popular, uh, was a twist to a point and, and with a certain with a group of folks. But I, I, I have to, see, this is the thing about not having experience. I mean, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm interested in now is this autogenic phase of, of imperial kinds of war. And that is the ways in which the, the, the person doing the, the entity doing the imperialize it, imperializing, if you want to use that term, is also placing itself at risk in ways that it doesn't know. I mean, in pretty fatal ways. Whether that's turning the same kind of security apparatus back on the citizen decree, whether that's looking to deploy and mobilize planetary processes of catastrophe, that the whole world can suffer. It can't be localized. And I mean, you, um, you provided those examples in terms yeah. of Asian Army. Yeah. Or even Daisy Cutter. We used to take the top rope of mountain, the Daisy Cutter. We talk about shocking off. Yeah, yeah. And within, you know, maybe a day, we had a fire base up on top of this mountain yeah. and survey everything around us. Well, we defoliated everything and killed ourselves with the defoliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of goes on and on and on. But I see, I see all of this is just, yeah. you know, the logical extension of what we did then, which was the logical yeah. extension of Korea, yeah. and so on. Yeah. And we can track it back, yeah. probably to Dusan's, one of Dusan's uh, favorite scenes, which is the opening of 2001, The Space Odyssey, where one of them brains the other. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, can I ask you a question? I mean, maybe this is the time. I'm just getting people I have to go. I'm interested in this. Is, in, in your experience, I mean, just briefly, let me put you on the spot, but I'm very curious about this. Um, in the way that you experienced um, the home front and the battlefield, did you experience, how, I guess, how do you, did you experience those things, especially in terms of the people who were protesting and, and the other kind of things that were going on? Did you feel alienated? Did you feel people at there at home, you know, really, really yeah, good? There was no patriot, I guess, right? Yeah, you're around. Okay, and you know, quite frankly, if if, if, if we had a draft right yeah. now, yeah. this crap in Afghanistan and yeah. Iraq, yeah, that's right. Right. That's a key. That's a key difference, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I, was I mean, that was the big thing. Yeah. Although, and I was an anti-war COVID yeah. protester both before and after my deployment. Yeah. Yeah. Although coming home, you know, it was kind of. I think that was the first war mm -hmm. where one day you were in a firefight and the next day you were in San Francisco or Los Angeles or Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. um, I think that's that was the big the shocker. Yeah. The other question I was going to ask you, and I'm sorry, we should we should be sharing this. Um, is uh, are you disappointed? You don't have to answer this all the time. Are you disappointed, or how do you feel about the the anti-war movement? What do you think? There. <laughs> no sense. I mean, yeah. shot you or, uh, you know. No, I'm not surprised there's no drafts and nobody, you know, who in this room is at risk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except the folks who have enlisted, mm -hmm. maybe in the Guard or the Reserve, or being, you know, or yeah. in there and yeah. after it. Yeah, and I guess, I guess what I'm trying to do in a very, very modest way is to talk about how that risk is starting to spread 
clearly an area I need to work. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to put us on, on the hook in an overly, uh, you know, heroic way. I mean, it's a post-heroic <coughs> way. But I also don't want to keep putting up with this assumption that we can continue living this bubble or participating in, uh, you know, in, in, in these grotesque forms of financial, physical, military, whatever else sorts of violence. Without that also um, having pretty transformative effect on, on what it is we think we're preserving by carrying out that violence. Well, those are part of the current generation is why they are not out of the streets mm -hmm. protesting our economic rape at the hands of Wall Street and the Washington, you know, and the Washington insiders, you know, and all these other groups <laughs> that are running our lives, and even though we may not want to or be prepared to admit, admit it to ourselves. That's where the social movement could be, in my opinion. No, I appreciate your honesty. I'm going to have a last question. Yeah. Um, where do you situate social networks within a situation of war? I, 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 think the, I think the whole basis of net-centric sorts of thinking, to the extent that it has, to the extent that it has you know, an application Within war, that can be both for and against it. Which war? You know, class war. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm anti-war altogether. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's an easy thing to say. You know, I am anti-war. All right, I'm anti-war. But, but yeah, I'm not anti-conflict. I'm not anti-anti-fighting. I'm not anti-fighting for the right thing. <laughs> but maybe the right things aren't necessarily going to be subsumed within the kinds of categorical boxes that we may be more comfortable keeping them in if that bubble situation of the 5% considering 95% which had to have more worry about any form of violence or any blowback if you let it from any of the kinds of things that are going on. So <coughs> I, I would say that, it's, that, that to, to the extent that, there, that the network is a viable way to think about both you know, acts of coercion and violence and, and acts of, 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 of counter practice you know, against and within those things, I would say it has to be international. But I would say it also, and this is just Speculative, so you know, those me that kind of question, maybe. Um, you know, it, it also may make you know, uh, 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 involve the kinds of things that we aren't used to having to make political. You know, I mean, choices in consumers' practices, or or different forms of allegiances between, you know, so, you know, this is my favorite part of this post real review: jobs, police brutality, and the NAACP. Right? These and things Maine. are linked up. What's that? In Maine. In Maine, yes. In Maine in two places. Uh, and, uh, you know, those kinds of, we have a horrible history in this country of being sectarian in our progressive sorts of politics. And if you want to open that up to the network question, it's got to extend beyond national borders and even beyond usual forms of understanding politics. Not according to necessarily individual human agency or heroic forms of leadership or even representative democracy in any of the ways that we currently don't experience it. You know, um, I think there are all kinds of expansive possibilities that there remain to be invented. Uh, to end on rather than the, the, uh, the memory of the human race. Thank you. All right, hey. Thank you.